What's up, Discovery Church Online? Thanks for tuning in. If you have any questions or want to learn more about who we are as a church, then find us online at ilovediscovery.church. Or you can download our app free from wherever you download apps from. Today, we'll continue on with part four of our series, The Best Year Ever. Good morning, Discovery Church. How are you guys doing today? Doing good? The conclusion of our series here, The Best Year Ever. And uh, if you're new, man, you can catch up. I'll try to catch up briefly, but you can catch up online. Um, or We have videos. You have an audio. Uh, you, you got, if you really want this year to be different and maybe just maybe experience the best year ever, like I encourage you to go check out this, this series online. Um, what would that, I mean, at the end of this year, what if you could look back and go, man, this year was the best year ever ever. What what if you could do that? I believe you can. I really believe you can. And it doesn't matter so much what happens to you this year. It matters what happens inside of you. Like you can, you can inside of you, you can, you can be changed. You can be transformed. You can respond to the problems, the trials, the difficulty, the attacks of the enemy differently and position yourself for an amazing year. Maybe even the best year, the best year ever. This says our theme verse, Proverbs 23, verse seven says, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. So what we've been discovering is that our lives move. They actually move in the direction of our thoughts. That our thoughts, they actually have creative power. And, and as I'm teaching this, and, and even today and throughout this series, I know some people are like, New Year's Shmoo Year, man. This sounds like a positive thinking mumbo jumbo stuff, Pastor. And then, and then I just, I, I can tell. But some others are leaning in going, come on, you're ready to take notes. You're like, oh yeah. I'm ready for this. Like, I'm a, like, I know my thoughts have power. I know that God can, can do a great thing this year. And you're like, you're ready for it. Can I tell you something? Like, no matter where you're at today and where your thoughts are at today and how you're approaching this topic, can I tell you something? That your thoughts are more powerful than you think. It, they, they just have more power and more influence over your life than you can imagine. Like, even right now, your posture right now as I'm teaching this, it, it, it reveals a lot about the direction of 2018 for you. About how, what are you thinking about in the direction of your life? Your thoughts matter more than you could ever imagine, which is why for three weeks I've been telling you, you'll never change your life until you change the way you think. That instead of, instead of you know, focusing on your new routines and habits and things like that that you want this year, which is fine, but we're going we're gonna to do those things fine, but, but maybe before we, we can... Let's not rest our success on those things. Let's ask God to do an inner work inside of our life. Let's invite God to do something from the inside out, changing the way we think. So let me catch up really quickly. Part one was, was about um, what's on your mind, like what, where bad thinking comes from and how do we, how, why does it matter? Why does good thinking? So we introduced that with part one. Part two was about the battlefield of the mind, that this is the, the mind is the primary window of spiritual warfare so we talked about how to guard against your mind engage in that battle part three was last week a very practical message on how to how to have transformed thinking and that's actually how you become a brand new person is to be transformed by the renewing of our mind so how do we how do we have transformed thinking and carry that out on a daily basis so it's a very practical message if you miss any of those please catch them online i really hope by now you're starting to see some some, some changes, maybe making some, some groundwork uh, done in the area of your thought life. I hope by now you're starting to see a little bit more and you're thinking about what you're thinking about more and it's producing something different inside of your life. But as I was studying, an interesting topic kept coming up for this series and I wasn't expecting it and I, needed, I just needed to have one message in this series about this topic because I got well, this final, this conclusion is, let me give you the last secret to the best year ever. And it it was an unexpected one for me, but write this down. You'll never change the way you think until you change the way you talk. You never change the way you think until you change the way you talk. There is a a correlation, a direct connection between what you're thinking and what you're saying. They both support and feed off of one another. Like you can influence the other with the other. Do you know that? You can influence your, th- your thoughts with your words. 
You can influence your words with your thoughts. There is a direct connection between the heart and the mind and the mouth, what's coming out. People talk about what they're thinking about. That's what, what, what whatever people are thinking about the most is going to come out of their mouth. And you know, like you get around some people and all they talk about is what you just know. You're going to get around that person. Man, he's going to talk about cowboys. That's what he's going to talk about. You were just talking about, there he is. He's raising up his hands. I was in the lobby and, 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 and talking, talking to some, some guys and, and what's on his, on his mind, cowboys, cowboys, like whatever's on, cause it's, you know, it's anyway, whatever's, whatever's there though is going to, is going to come up. I love you anyway, brother. I love you to death, man. Matthew 12, 34, Jesus says, for out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. That's, that's what's coming out of our mouth, whatever, whatever is inside of our heart overflowing. Now, if you're a man, you're overflowing about 20,000 words a day is what's happening. Now, if you're a woman, you're overflowing about 30,000 words a day. You get 50% more than a man, which is about right, huh, guys? Right? There was one guy that was, he was, he, he, one guy that was asked, he's like, by another guy, he said, hey, do, do you, does it ever bother you or do you resent the fact that your wife always has to have the last word? And he says, no, man, I'm just glad when she finally gets around to it. <laughs> Come on. That was funny. So our, rever- the, our words, they reveal our heart, but they also have, they also have power, right? We're, we're, we're talking about the thought life having power, and there is creative power in, in, in the thought life. But, but listen, when, when God created the heavens and the earth, what he do? He spoke. He said, he said, let there be light. Let there be. So there's, there's, there is this direct connection. Proverbs 18, 21 says that the tongue has the power of life and death. Like that's, that's, you can, you can promote and produce life this year, like favor and success. And, and I'm not talking about a prosperity gospel, nothing like that. I'm just, I'm just talking Bible here, you guys. If you learn to speak life, he says, you can eat the fruit of that. Like, you'll eat the fruit. Like, if you're speaking life, he says, you're going to eat the fruit of life. You'll have the, the fruit of it or the production, what it, the result of, of the, your, your words would be life coming back to you. This, if you're speaking death and negativity and criticism and toxicism, and it, you're going to eat the fruit of that as well. You have the power of life and death in your words and what we say. Uh, words are powerful beyond our imagination, you guys. Most people don't understand the connection between the heart or the mouth and the mind, but they work hand in hand. They really do. You can't have a, a message about thoughts without talking about, without talking about words, which is why the Bible says in Romans 10, verse 9 and 10, um, it says this, that if you confess with your what? With your mouth, Jesus is Lord. And then as well, you believe in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For two things here, for it's with the heart that you believe and you're justified, and it's with your mouth that you confessed and are what? Saved, meaning deliver. That's what he's talking about. Salvation, meaning deliverance, results from what your heart believes and your mouth confesses. Are you following me, church? Your deliverance is a result of what your heart believes and what your mouth confesses. It's both. Like they, they are connected and they feed off one another. There's a connection between belief and what we say. So we say we believe, but most of our words are unbelief. So we, we, we say we love someone, but most of our words are hurting them. We can't separate these, these two. So like at a wedding, uh, this is like, like known this has been part of culture that this repetitive nature speak the words speak the words because we've known the power of words like we did a wedding recently and one of the couples is here newly weds and in, in the audience today and it, I, I always do a part repeat after me repeat after me i so and so will take and as long as we both shall live till death do us part sometimes they say are are in sickness and in health for better or for worse i will love and honor and cherish and 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 it's and we use the words because there is power in our words, when someone is getting sworn into the office, what do we do? We say, okay, I know you got good intentions, but you need to speak this, okay? So you speak it. Or when someone is, is, is taking on, like, you know, in court, you know, raise your hand and repeat after me. This is, there is power, you guys, in your words. So if you want to change your thinking, we need to learn how to change our words. We have to change, we have to change the way we're speaking. 
We have to change the words that are coming out of our mouth. Jesus taught that your words are connected to your, mo- your, your mind and your heart and your faith. Look what he said in Mark chapter 11, verse 23. I'm not sure if it's in your notes or up here on the screens. I had quite a few verses in my study. I'm going to try to give them to you. If they're not in your notes, write them down. He said, I tell you the truth. If anyone says to this mountain, go, throw yourself into the sea. And does not doubt in his heart, but believes what he says, it will be done for him. Okay, there's it's it's he could have just said, if you have faith enough for that mountain and believe it, or he didn't say, if you think that mountain away, it'll go away. No, right? No, no, no. There's those thoughts need to manifest themselves as faith through words. He says, You gotta speak to that mountain, and your heart needs to be in agreement with that. Okay, there's 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 this direct connection. If you want, again, if you want to change the way you think, we got to learn how to change our words and align them to the will, the word of God as well. Revelations in 12 verses 11 says they overcame him, meaning the enemy, um, by two things, by the blood of the lamb and by what? The word of their testimony. Look, if you don't have a word of, uh, of your if you don't have a testimony, a word of your testimony, then, then you don't have victory. If all, if all you, you don't. Okay, I have the blood. We have the blood. I mean, we're saved by the blood. But the blood gives you a word of your testimony. You need, and, oh, sometimes I, I hear people, they say, oh, I, don't, I just don't have, I don't know what my testimony is. You better find your testimony. In finding that, you'll find your salvation. Are you hearing me? Because if you don't have a testimony, you, you, you don't, look, it's, it's both. There, we, we, need it. we are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. And by the word that I've been set free. I was once lost, but now I'm found. I was once broken, but now I'm healed. I was once blind, but now I have sight. By the, it's both. It's, it's the blood and, and the word. They come together. For some, this is bad news, though, because your mouth is out of control, and you know it. Okay? You're like, you, you just know it. it's like one of the things, and, and, and you've come to, some of you have even come to accept it. That this is just, ah, it's just everyone knows I just kind of, that's just who I am. It's just, what I, it's, just, it's just what I do. We say negative things, things that we like to take back. We got into some pretty bad habits with our, with our words. And if you want this year to be the best year ever, you want to change your thinking, you got you to change your, your, your words, change the way you speak. It, it reminds me of this story, this, this guy who, who was having a hard time in this area, and he said, I'm just going to become a monk. And so he goes and talks to the abbot, which is the, the, the head monk, and he says, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna go to the monastery. You know, that's what I'm gonna do. And the, and the abbot, the head monk, says, Okay, this is what you do. You got you gotta take um, a vow of silence, and you only can speak two words every three years. That's that's the deal. And he says, Sign me up, I'm in. All right, I'm just I'm at the end of my rope. So three years goes by, and the abbot comes to him and says, What are your two words? And he says, uh, food cold. And the abbot goes, okay. And so he makes sure the food is nice and, and, and warm for him and, and, and heated up. Three more years comes by, and the abbot comes in. What are your two words? And he says, robe dirty. So the abbot made sure his clothes were washed and, and, and made nice and clean. Three more years goes by, and the abbot comes in again, and he says, what are your two words? And he says, bed hard. And the abbot goes, okay. He just, he just stuffs that, makes sure the bed is stuffed, restuffed, and nice and soft for him. Three more years comes by. And he comes and says, what are your two words? And he finally says, I quit. <laughs> and the, the abbot says, well, figures, all you've done is complain since you got here. <laughs> all of us, now all of us have gotten into trouble with our words, right? Everyone in here, we just said some things we could take back, right? We've, we've said some things, we've reacted in ways that we, would, we just wish we could take back. But your words, listen, your words are non-refundable. You can't, you can't get them back once they're out there. They will, they will create. You will eat that fruit. You will eat the fruit of whatever that word was, whether it was life or death. You know, there's also no, no words that are just um, good or bad. There are no neutral words. They're not. Words will either bring life or they'll bring death. And we're going to eat the fruit of those things. The book of James, chapter 3. James has a lot to say about words. He says we all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, though, He's a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check just because of the words he says. He says, man, if, if, if you can control your mouth, you, your whole life will be in check. He says, you're, you'll be perfect. Now, that word perfect, don't get hung up, doesn't mean sinless, 
perfection, it, it means that literal translation of that word means mature or healthy is what it means. So the opposite of that is true is, as well. If you can't control your tongue, your life will be out of control. It, it, it will be without your control. And, and it also shows something. It reveals that you are immature, spiritually unhealthy. And some of us are, and, I, and, and, and that may be a hard pill to swallow for you today, and that's why it's, it, it starts off as bad news. I'm going to give you some good news later, but we need to just kind of look this in the mirror and say, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm immature in this area, and it's, it, in my life is, is, is reflecting, I'm eating the fruit. There's some areas of my life that's gotten out of control because of this lack of emotional um, stability in the area of my words. And some people say, well, I've got to be able to express my mind and my feelings. No, that's the problem, okay? Stop it. Stop. You're, you're, we're too jacked up to express everything that comes up, okay? All of us are. All of us, all of us have this sin issue. Every one of us have, have a sin issue. And, and what we need to be doing instead of just ex, you know, being free to express every feeling is, remember, you need to take that thought captive and bring it under the obedience of Christ so that you can develop some maturity and health. Amen? Um, when you go to the doctor, you say, when you say, you know, I'm not feeling well, one of the things the doctors do is they say, stick out your tongue, right? Okay, open up your mouth, stick out your tongue, because the, the tongue reflects, it reveals some of the, the issues that are happening inside of us. That's not just true physically, that's true spiritually as well. That tongue will reveal what's happening inside of us. The book of James is such a practical book. He's such a great communicator. We're going to study real quickly James chapter 3 and what he has to say about the words he has three reasons why we need to take our words seriously let me give them to you number one my tongue directs where i go we need to take our words seriously because our tongue directs where i where i go our words have tremendous influence over our life they're going to take you up or they can they can tear you down you see your words don't only tear other people down they can tear your tongue steers your life. Words spoken by your tongue determine the direction of your life. Look what verse 3 says in James chapter 3. He says, when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. You think, oh, the tongue is so small. I mean, a horse is two, 3,000 pounds. I mean, controlled by this small bit. He says, or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Now listen, that is, that is what sometimes happens, even in experiences like this, where you feel the breath of God just blow on you. You ever feel that, man? Where you just feel the wind of the Holy Spirit just, just, just blowing in your cells. Come on, now, some of you do. Some of you have experienced that, and you have the Holy Spirit, but you have not tamed the tongue, so you're, in the, you're still going in the wrong direction. I mean, wind's blowing in your cells, but your rudder is off. So you, you, God's blowing on you, you're getting the word, you're getting revelation, but you have, no, you have no maturity in this area. You haven't mastered the tongue, therefore the direction of your cells are just going the wrong way. Even though you're receiving revelation, you're, re you're receiving the wind of the Holy Spirit. You see him, you sense him, you experience him, you hear from him. But that small rudder is, is directing your life instead of the wind of the Holy Spirit. Amen, somebody? My tongue, it directs our, our life. Hundreds of tons, this, these ships. But like the guy who tried to become a monk, silence isn't, isn't the answer to the misuse of the tongue either. Because you, you don't solve a problem of an unho unruly horse or, or you know, by keeping it in the barn or the problem of a hard-to-steer ship by keeping it tied to the dock. Okay, God wants, God wants to lead you, to guide you. He, wants, he has a plan for your life. He has a purpose for 2018. At the end of this year, he wants you to be somewhere specific. He wants you to be so, somewhere intentional. He is shaping your destiny. And some of you think like, well, well, if I just, and it's, and it's good to speak less and listen more. Don't get me wrong. You should, every one of us should, should do that. But you should also learn how to steer that ship. Amen? My, my, my tongue, my tongue directs where I go. Here's the second thing James says to us. My tongue can destroy what I have. My tongue can destroy what I have. So God, I mean, the, the enemy is not just the only one who has the des destructive powers, to steal, kill, and destroy. You have creative and destructive power as well. 
Like it can, it can, God can bless you and provide for you and, and give you so much this year. It can, and it can all go up in flames by, by just the words that we speak. Sometimes our words, they're like a sledgehammer. We swing them without, without, without thinking and all of a sudden we look around and all we've got is a pile of relational rubble. And when, when we thoughtlessly sling our words around and tear people down, your relationships are going to suffer. It'll destroy. Look, James gives an illustration of this beautiful forest, tall trees up in smoke because just of a small spark. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. Just recently, we had the, the Thomas fire. I started in uh, like the, I believe, Santa Paula area. Small b- brush fire. That's where it starts. Small brush fire, Santa Paula it spread 282,000 acres. It is the, it's the largest on-record fire in, in, uh, ever. This is the, it costs $177 million just to fight that fire. It started just as a small spark. That's just like our words. Get, do you know, um, maybe have you ever met a verbal arsonist? Someone who, who just, with their, with their words, they destroy friendships. They can, they can deflate people's momentum, vision, motivation, maybe even destroy their careers or their kids. Verbal arson. He says, he says the tongue is also a fire. Man, it starts, it starts as a small, but it, it, he says it sets the whole course of his life on fire. That small tongue, that's, that small insignificant word that, that, that did not go filtered through, that was not taken captive, that was not brought into the obedience of Christ, that small spark set the whole course of his life on fire, and it itself is set on fire, he said, by hell. That's the power of your words. They, they create this chain reaction. Proverbs 21 and 23 has some wisdom about it as well. He says, if you want to stay out of trouble, be careful what you say that right there solved 95 percent of your fights boom there's your marriage counseling bam i just just solved your marriage problems right there just just be careful what you say man just shut up okay just shut up just all right just if you want to stay out of trouble that's seriously just just be careful what's coming out of that out of that mouth isn't it right i mean Think about the arguments, the fights, the things that we, if we'd be in so much less trouble, have so much heartache and difficulty in our life. If we just were more careful with what we, what we said at the beginning of this series, I said, man, God wants to change our life. And we're going to change our life, but change the way we think. But we can't change the way we think until we start changing our words. James continues, he says, all kinds of animals have been tamed by man, but no man can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil, he says full of deadly poison. Literally there, he's, he's, it's a venom, a deadly, deadly venom. And our words can be a deadly weapon. They can poison people. James gives us a third reason why our words are so important. He says, my tongue displays what I'm thinking. My tongue displays what I'm thinking. It reveals your character. It reveals your heart. J- James starts meddling in our business here in verse 10. He says, out of the same mouth, come praise and cursing. He says, man, guys, that shouldn't happen. That shouldn't, that should not be so. But and listen, some of you don't praise because of this reason. That's one of the reasons why we have a hard time praising is because we know what we did. But just because you messed up, listen, please, don't let that stop your praise. Okay, don't, don't let that stop your praise because there is power in your words. Your praise becomes a prophetic declaration that brings transformation. It'll, it'll, it'll start setting a new course for your heart and your life and your thoughts when you start declaring the praises. But what James is referring to here is how sometimes we can act as uh, thermos, thermometers instead of thermostats. That's what he's talking about here, is, is that sometimes we reflect the atmosphere that we're in instead, like a thermometer just reflects the atmosphere that it is in, instead of being a thermostat and in, in setting, the, setting the temperature of the atmosphere. That's what he's talking about here. So, so if there's praise, in church, I mean, we're praising. If there's praise, we're going to praise. That's the atmosphere. If it's worship, we're going to worship. If it's, if it's lighthearted and funny, we're going to laugh. We're going to laugh. But put you in an environment where it's tense, you're tense. Put you in an environment where there's, where there's hurting, you're hurting. Put you in an environment where there's, where there's war and fighting, you're fighting. 
He says, brothers, this shouldn't be so. So you shouldn't be easily tossed and changed. You should set the course of your life. You should set the course of your words. Your atmosphere should not change what words are coming out of your mouth. He says, man, that, that, that shouldn't be so. We, we, we're in here in church singing and then fighting on the way home with our spouse, you know. We're in the kitchen arguing and the phone rings and then all of a sudden you change your tone, right? Oh, hey, brother. Hey, sister. You know. Don't every one of us have done that. Come on now. <laughs> James, he, he kind of tells us where, where the problem is. And in, in starting in verse 10, 11, he says, can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? So he tells us, hey, go look back at the source. So, so OK, where are your words directing you today? Can we just think about that? What, what, where are my words directing me today? Are they directing me to God's purpose? Are they directing me towards my destiny? Are they directing me in a, w- in, in, in a way that glorifies God or not? Let's look back at this source then. Let's look back at the headwaters, the head springs. Where are they coming from? You're going to find the problem and the solution. Here's the problem, you guys. Write this down. This sums up the whole series right here. It's a heart problem. That's what's really going on. It's a heart problem. Our thinking and our words are just exposing our hearts. You want to hear something liberating, guys? God's not looking at your actions. God's not looking at what you're doing or what you're not doing. He's looking at your heart. And he doesn't want you to act right. He wants you to be right. There's a big difference. God's not trying to get you to act right. He doesn't even want you to act right. He wants you to be right. Jesus said what's inside you is what's going to come out. Actions are just symptoms of a heart condition. Look what Jesus says in Matthew 15. But the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart. And these are what make a man unclean. Okay, are, are, you, are you tracking here? Because it started in the heart and manifested in your words, now you're unclean. Look, if it started in the heart and you took it captive, before it came out of your mouth, you wouldn't be unclean. Oh, man, I hope you're catching this revelation today, you guys. If you want, you can't change the way you're thinking until you change your words. He says, now from out of the heart comes evil thoughts. Murder and adultery and sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander, all that stuff. It's a, it's a heart problem. So what do we do? What do we, how do we solve this? Um, I, I, I set you up. I did. This whole series was a setup for this, this part of the message today. Because... Um, the, you're seeing some change, I'm sure you are, but you're also seeing some frustration in trying to change your thought life, in trying to have the best year ever, in trying to be changed and transformed. There, there is some tension that is created, and that I, I honestly hope, I was hoping that there was some frust- a little bit of frustration that was created in our lives because of this. You know, want to know why? Because you can't really change your life until God does. And, and, even, and even some of the change like, like you can do by your own effort, some of that change that you can produce, which you can, you can do a little bit, but that's not the kind of change you need. The kind of change you need is the kind that Jesus can give and the kind that only Jesus can. The only, I mean, you can't change your life until God changes it. So let me give you God's solution here, really, because it's a hard problem. Let me give you the solution to the whole, to the whole thought life, the, the battlefield of your mind, and directing your course of your year to have the best year ever, changing your thoughts, changing your words. There is a solution that God's word has. It actually comes by the way of a prophetic word from the prophet Ezekiel. And Ezekiel um, gives this word of, of a prophetic future word of what God is, is going to do and will do in the times of the new covenant through Jesus Christ. And what he desires to do to solve this problem that we've all had, the problem of our heart. All right, let me give you the solution. Write them down. Here's God's solution to this whole thing. This whole series is summed up right here. Number one, God wants to cleanse your past. God wants to cleanse your past. Nothing can begin until we get uh, until we settle the, the past, settle our yesterdays. Some of us are, the reason why our thoughts are the way they are is because of the wounds of yesterday, the hurts of yesterday, the battles of yesterday. And, 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 and they, some of the words that we're saying, they're fueled by your past. They're fueled by the hurts of, of your past. And, and, and nothing can begin until we get past yesterday. And I'm not talking about covered. I'm talking about cleansed. Not, not forgiven, erased. Too many people are trapped in their yesterdays, and this is the miracle of salvation of what God can do. 
And some of us play that if only game and we're trapped there. If only I could do it over again. If only I had listened sooner. If only I could erase the past. If only I could forgive myself. And the thing to remember is that, you guys, no one is perfect. We all have regrets. Every single one of us. We've all made some bad choices. Even Maybe even last year, there's some things you wish you could take back. We said some foolish things. We've all wasted time, hurt ourselves, hurt others. So how do you release those regrets? How do you, how do you get rid of those things? Some of us, in, being in ministry, I've seen people try to do it a few different ways. And maybe you're here today and you've tried to do it one of these ways. One, it's literally already in your notes, but some of you are trying to bury your past. Some of you are just trying to like stuff it under the carpet, bury the past. Like it will never help you. It will never help you get past your regrets. You, can, you try to minimize it like, oh, it wasn't a big deal. It wasn't a big deal. You try to forget it. It's not going to work. Some people try to blame others. They try to blame others for their past and their mistakes, and that's not going to work either. Some others, they, they try to beat themselves up. They try to just punish themselves for their past mistakes. None of those things work, you guys. None of those things are going to get you past your past. Here's the answer. answer. Let's go to Ezekiel 36, verse 25. We'll start there. He says, this is a prophetic word. God, of God is saying, I will, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. See, what we really need is a fresh start. That's what we need in 2018. Like some of you need a fresh start today. You need, some of you need that today. Like God wants to cleanse you from your past. And there's no, there's no sense in, in moving forward in 2018 until that happens. Because that's going to that's gonna continue to hang you up. That's number one. That's God's solution. Number one. God wants to cleanse you from your past. Here's the second thing. God wants to change you. He does. God is in the business of changing people. But it's not the change that sometimes we think. He wants to change you from the inside out. God wants to change you from the inside out. He's not worried about what you're doing. He's not. God doesn't get hung up in what you're doing. He knows what's really happening. God doesn't want you to just modify your behavior. He wants to change you into a brand new person. God does not do behavioral modification. All right? I know, I know that's a big thing right now, and that's in like schools and education, and, and, and some of you parents are hearing a lot about that, or some of you in the education or psychology field and all that stuff. I mean, there's merit in it, but that's not how God works. God does not use behavioral modification. He uses heart transplants. That's what God does. God, God wants to change you. Religion, that's, that's religion, I'm telling you. Outside in is religion. Every year, you didn't know it, but every year you, you approach the new year based on a religious mindset thinking that by changing your actions, by changing your habits, you're going to produce some better outcome in your year. No, you won't. That's just, that's the, the religion just tries to shine up something that's broken. It's, it's taking a broken car, broken beat down car with a bad engine and giving it a paint job. It's still, that thing's still jacked up. It's still a broken beat down car. It's still broken. You can't do anything with it. Ezekiel 36, 26 says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. That's what you need that's the solution to our heart problem, to our thought problem, to even our word problem. God wants to put a new heart and spirit in you and remove that old heart that's been wounded and hurt and beat up and stomped on, that heart of stone, and give you a heart of flesh. God wants to change you from the inside out. He takes care not only of yesterday, he takes care of today. Number three, he wants to give you power for tomorrow. Look at this. He, God wants to give you his thoughts. God wants to give you his thoughts. You actually become a new person with new thoughts. Because you're a new person, you have new thoughts. Continuing Ezekiel there, he says, and I'll put my spirit in you. And this is the beautiful thing about the gospel. When you get the power of God in you, he says, and I will move you to follow my decrees. Man, wouldn't that be nice, man, to have the power of God in you, to actually move you, to have the right thoughts, to have the right words, to have the right actions? He says, that's the best. This, when you have the power, when his, when his power comes in you, the Bible isn't work anymore. Following God isn't, isn't work anymore. Not, it, it's not a book that tells you what to do. It becomes you. They're not laws anymore. It's your delight. It, it goes from got to to get to, I like to say. When you get a new spirit in you, it's no longer got to, it's I get to. It's the delight of my heart. God wants to change you from the inside out. I mean, this is the solution. This is. And then lastly, because you're still in this world, all right? And I'm going to give you the, the feeling in just a moment. 
But I want to do a little Bible study with you, okay, before you, so don't check out. I'm going to give you, after I give you this feeling, we're going to have a little bit more Bible study to do because this is important. Because God does, God does erase your past. He does that. Man, that's what salvation, that's a beautiful thing, man. He just erases and cleanses your past. But he, he wants to give, change you now from the inside out by putting a new spirit in you, a new heart in you, and that, that is what moves you and compels you. It's, it's, not, even, it's not religion, it's inside, it's inside out. But you're still in the world. You're, you're, still, you're still kind of the dual natures that we've been talking about in this series. You still have an enemy, so number four is important. God wants to give you his, his protection. God wants to give you his protection. Now, I'm going to talk about what his protection looks like, so don't check out on me, okay? This verse is not in your notes. It's the verse right before the one in your notes. Verse 12 of Ephesians 6 reminds us. Let me just remind you. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Or there's a battle going on right now. There's, there's spiritual warfare that's happening in the, in the battlefield of our mind, and it's not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. Like, that is happening, that is, that is, and it's going to continue to happen. That's what's really going on. So what does God's protection look like against the spiritual forces of evil that are fighting our thoughts? The answer is in the next verse. Therefore, put on the full armor of God. Therefore, suit up. You're in battle. Put on the full armor of God. When Paul wrote about the armor of God, he was in prison, changed, chained actually to a Roman guard and he used that armor of the centurion that roman centurion as a model for spiritual armor paul says just like this guy suits up for battle every day child of god you need to suit up for battle every day and some of you 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 have a new heart and a new spirit and you and you you even have god giving you thoughts but you walk out of your house every day without the armor and you're in battle and we wonder why we're getting hurt and wounded and affected so much by this world. He says, therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you can be able to stand your ground. And then after you've done everything to stand, stand firm then. And he gets into this armor. Let me, me kind of just break this down for you. He says, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, the belt holds all the other pieces of the armor together. It's so the, all the, it's so the armor's not flying around and flinging around. That when you, we have, to have the belt of truth on means that we make no compromise with the truth. That God is, God is truth. His word is truth. And, and, and just because something looks like a fact or comes at me as truth, it's a reality now. God has the ra- last word. God's word is true. Speak words of life. Then he says, the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate covers and protects the heart. Putting on the breastplate means I'm living free of condemnation. I have the righteousness of Christ. I, I, I approach the enemy from a standpoint of, of, of uh, conviction and of courage because I'm not dressed with my own righteousness. I'm in the righteousness of Christ. That's the breastplate of righteousness. I am dressed for battle. I move in confidence. When I approach the enemy, I'm under the covering of the blood of Christ. Then he says, have your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. That's the the protect our feet for the battlefield. Putting the shoes of peace on means that we live in unity with the Holy Spirit and with people. That we walk in in unity. And that's that's an area where the enemy can come in our thought life when we're we're disunified with the Holy Spirit. Meaning, the Holy Spirit is telling you to do something you're stiff-arming him. Or, when, when brothers and sisters in Christ, you're living in disunity. He says, no, that, that, that you need to put on the shoes of peace. Then he goes on, he said, in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith. The shield covers the rest of the armor. He put it on the shield of faith. Just trust God. It, it extinguishes all the fiery darts and arrows of the enemy. Take the helmet of salvation. The helmet protects the mind, which is the battlefield. But the Roman helmet for the soldier, it protected the whole facial area as well as the head. So that speaks to guarding what you hear. Guarding what you see, guarding what you think, what you speak. Put on the helmet of salvation. I've received salvation. I'm guarding my mind from the lies of the enemy and from confusion. Take the sword, he says, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The sword of the Spirit. 
Using that means we have the Word of God in our hearts. We meet every attack of the enemy with the Word of God. We use the Word of God to cleanse us, our own wounds, our own battle wounds. We use the Word of God to cleanse us. Then he says, and then pray in the Spirit on all occasions. Praying in the Spirit is a powerful weapon of warfare. It's praying God's perfect will into whatever situation you're in. You don't know what's going on. You don't know the answers. But praying in the Spirit prays the perfect will of God into your situation. If you let him, church, if you let him, God will cleanse you. God can take care of yesterday. God can erase and cleanse you, make you a new person today, give you power for tomorrow, and give you an armor to stand up under with. There's, in just a moment, we're going we're to worship God in just a moment, just like the last several weeks in this series. Just We've been changing this up just a little bit, just because I'm, I, we just believe God is leading us in this season to encounter him and to seek him more. Um, just trying to be sensitive to that, but I don't want you to rush in this moment and, and kind of, because we're going to have some more announcements at the end and stuff, but there's another weapon that we have that I want you to declare today in worship. Because some of you came in with, you're, you're like, you're in, you're in a battle right now. Sense it. There, like there is battle that is happening right now and it is real. Like every one of us are in warfare, but some of you are in the thick of it. You're, you're, you're fighting for your marriage. You're fighting for your sanity. Some of you are fighting for your mind. Some of you are fighting, you're fighting battles right now. And, and not only all this, but can I give you another weapon? The name of Jesus. That as you declare the name of Jesus, darkness flees. The enemy submits. And today, come on, let's stand to our feet together. Can I just encourage you to posture your heart right now? Don't get in a rush, but can you just declare with me the name of Jesus? Come on, you, that's a weapon of warfare right there. Jesus, come on, declare it, church. You make the darkness tremble. Jesus. Come on, church. Jesus. Let them do it right now. Jesus. Jesus. so excited about all God is doing in and through your life and we would like to help you on that journey. To find out what your next steps are in your relationship with Christ, go to ilovediscovery.church forward slash next steps. At Discovery, it's our mission to teach people to love God passionately, love each other authentically, and change the world for the cause of Christ. And it's that mission that drives everything we do as a church. Don't forget to join us next week for another great message.